In a moment, you will hear a frequency which is known to cause paranormal experiences. Can you hear it? <laughs> well, you can't. That's just what's so terrifying about it. Peace. U.S. patent number 514169 is for Nikola Tesla's reciprocating engine, meant to induce sympathetic vibrations in buildings. Allegedly, in 1898, he almost destroyed his Manhattan laboratory by attaching the device to one of the support beams in the building, and in 1935, he insinuated to a reporter that he could use the device to destroy the Empire State Building. Vibration will do anything. It would only be necessary to step up the vibrations of the machine to fit the natural vibration of the building, and the building would come crashing down. That's why soldiers break step crossing a bridge. Tesla's referring to 19th century soldiers' nasty habit of destroying suspension bridges, like the Angers Bridge on the 16th of April, 1950. The regular vibrations caused by the steps of marching soldiers match the natural frequency of vibration of the bridge itself, and, well, it came crashing down. A similar thing happened in 1940, where wind excited the natural vibrating frequency of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. These events can be viewed through the lens of mechanical resonance, which occurs when a regular event, like soldiers marching, matches the natural frequency of vibration of a given system. This is roughly what happens when somebody sings and breaks a wine glass. They're able to match the wine glass's natural frequency of vibration, and at high enough volumes, the wine glass breaks. The natural frequency of vibration of the E string on a guitar is well, it's an E. If I pluck an E an octave higher on the A string, you'll still be able to hear an E ring out on the E string. This E string is ringing in sympathy with the note that I just plucked, but if I play another note, say an E flat for example, the E string won't ring out. Now if you hold down the damper pedal and talk directly into the body of a grand piano, you can induce mechanical resonance using nothing but your voice creating a haunting reverb effect. Now, you don't necessarily need to use strings for this mechanical resonance. You can use basically anything. Bridges, buildings, and yes, wine glasses all have a natural frequency of vibration. Everything has a natural frequency of vibration, including you. Mechanical Resonant Frequency of the Human Eye in Vivo is a paper published by the Air Force in 1976. It was determined that the resonant frequency of the human eyeball was about 18 hertz. 18 hertz is roughly the note D. Our eyes vibrate in the key of D. And when our eyes vibrate independently of our skulls, weird things start to happen. Researcher Vic Tandy had a series of paranormal experiences where he would see faint objects scurry about at the periphery of his vision. He traced these experiences to a vibrating fan in the ventilation system of his lab. The fan's frequency was measured at about 18 hertz, the resonant frequency of the eye. This just so happened to coincide with the eigentone, or the resonant frequency of the room itself. This amplified the frequency of the fan and the effects on the eyeball. When the fan was stopped, the frequency disappeared, and the paranormal sightings stopped as well. So basically, the ghosts were caused by sound. Because 18 hertz causes our eyeballs to vibrate, it interferes with visual transduction in the eyes themselves. Ocular resonance would cause false firings of photoreceptors in the retina. In theory, causing us to see things that just aren't there. A similar thing happens when you rub your eyes very hard. You see phosphenes, which are essentially bright lights across your field of vision. This particular frequency, the ghost frequency, which in theory causes your eyes to vibrate, occurs as infrasound, sound that occurs below 20 hertz, the lowest note that we can possibly hear. But just because your ears don't register a sound as having pitch doesn't mean it won't affect your body. It can still cause hearing damage at high decibels. Infrasound generated from wind turbines and industrial equipment is the cause of vibroacoustic syndrome, a degenerative disease with a wide host of terrible symptoms. Infrasound is, of course, also where the alleged brown note lies. No way. But ghosts? Can infrasound really trigger a paranormal experience through ocular resonance? 
So let's find out. I have here a subwoofer that's able to recreate that 18 hertz frequency. When I turn it on, you might not be able to actually hear anything, but this microphone that I'm recording into can. You can clearly see the 18 hertz rumble underneath the frequencies of my speaking voice. I'm not gonna sit here for 10 minutes and then report back on any experience that I might have. I can already tell you that even though I can't actually hear the sound, the sensation is kind of like this weirdly heavy physical one. It's kind of hard to really describe, but I'll check back in 10 minutes. Uh, so I didn't see any ghosts for sure, but let me see. Yeah, that's a huge relief. I mean, it, it's very anxiety inducing. It's like a sensation of like somebody is just like sort of pressing on your body here. You can't hear it, but there's definitely a sense that like something is wrong. Something's terribly, terribly wrong. I wasn't really a skeptic. I knew something would happen, but it was really something else to, for me to actually feel that. You know, maybe it's not like ghost inducing or whatever, but there is something there, and I wonder if infrasound has a place in music. Other people have wondered this too. In 2003, there was a study conducted during two concerts at Royal Festival Hall in London. There are two pieces on the program that had infrasound piped through the auditorium, and two pieces that did not have infrasound. The results of a survey conducted on audience members after the concert suggest a definite correlation between infrasound and a vague sense of impending doom. This brings up some interesting questions for us, as well as some possibilities. Is there a way for musicians and composers to exploit infrasound for emotional and artistic effect, even if we can't hear it? And, you know, if we can't hear it in any meaningful way, is it still part of the music? These are important questions to ask, but it's unfortunately fairly difficult to create true infrasound, especially using acoustic instruments. But there are a couple of ways of creating a sort of fake infrasound. If I play two tones at the same time that have the difference of the ghost frequency of 18 hertz, say 300 hertz and 318 hertz, they come together to create the illusion of 18 hertz. This technique is used to create binaural beats if you separate the two tones into left and right channels and listen back through headphones, although the catch-all name of this particular technique is something called a combination tone. I recently did a video a couple months back on this exact phenomena. It's important to emphasize the fact that this 18 hertz combination tone is an auditory illusion caused by the brain itself. There's absolutely no physical way that it would cause your eyeballs to resonate, but still, it sounds fairly spooky, right? You can also create fake infrasound using something called the missing fundamental effect. Our brains are super used to hearing a specific sequence of upper harmonics when you're listening back to notes in a melody. These harmonics are the same for everything in nature. It's the harmonic series. They're so used to the harmonic series, in fact, that if you take away the fundamental frequency of a given note, the note that we're actually hearing is a pitch, you can still hear the melody just as clearly your brain provides the fundamental for you. In other words, taking away the fundamental tone doesn't affect your pitch perception. So what if that fundamental was infrasound, say 18 hertz, the ghost frequency? Would we still be able to experience it due to the missing fundamental effect? Well, sort of. I mean, right now you're listening to the upper harmonics of 18 hertz, and it's kind of hard to tell what the fundamental is supposed to be. It does sound kind of spooky though. I mean, not enough to induce ocular resonance or anything like that, but it's as good a jumping off point as any to start if we want to actually make music with any of this stuff. Let's take a scale tuned to the upper harmonics of 18 hertz, the ghost frequency. This would mean simply taking multiples of 18 and assigning each multiple of 18 to a different key on the keyboard. This creates a microtonal scale that gets smaller and smaller as you go higher because the ratios between pitches get smaller the more you add, the distances between pitches get smaller as well. It creates a microtonal scale that behaves quite differently to other scales. I worked out a bass line that centered around the note F sharp, which has a five to four relationship back to the fundamental D, the ghost frequency. As a bass player, I know all too well the importance and ubiquity of the root fifth bass line, but I couldn't do that here. C sharp is the fifth of F sharp, and there's no C sharp low enough in the harmonic series of a D for me to use for a root fifth bass line. Instead, I had to settle for a fairly flat C natural, which has a seven to four relationship back to D. This forms a tritone, not a perfect fifth with my F sharp root. So the limitations of the scale itself forced me into a fairly devilish root tritone bass line. 
There are more options for melodies, however, because as you go higher and higher in the scale, there are more notes to choose from, which means that if I wanted to create tension in my melody, I could use complex harmonic ratios, and then I could resolve that to less complex harmonic ratios that we're more used to. I apply these ideas of a limited bass line and expanded melodic palette to an 8-bit sort of tune, since I found that the odd tuning of the scale itself worked really nicely to evoke the sound of kind of like an out-of-tune computer chip. Working on this tune was really fun for me, because even though I use a really logical system to construct the scale, I don't have years of experience with it. I have no experience with it. Because of the odd keyboard layout, I found myself not really thinking about notes, but more like the ratios between notes, which was kind of a cool way of working. But honestly, at the end of the day, I did what anybody does. I used my ear, to the best of my ability, to create music. This sort of idea of composing with the harmonic series of a fundamental too low to hear is actually not a new one. I got this idea from The Well-Tuned Piano by Lamont Young, a landmark achievement in experimental just intonated music. It was, quote, derived from partials of the overtone series of an inferred low fundamental E-flat 10 octaves below the lowest E-flat on the Bosendorfer Imperial. That's insanely low. That's way lower than 18 hertz, and that's way lower than any human or animal could ever possibly hear. Which makes me want to ask the question, does tuning a piano to the harmonics of a frequency that low actually mean anything? Does it even come close to affecting us the same way that true infrasound affects us? Does making a goofy microtonal groove tuned to 18 hertz actually mean anything as well? I mean, eh, maybe? The pieces themselves aren't really supposed to imitate infrasound. They're just kind of inspired by infrasound. They certainly won't bring about any of the physical effects of true infrasound, and definitely none of the ghost visions of Vic Tandy. But all of that is really missing the point. Music isn't just about how sound hits your body, although it is part of it. Music's mainly about how sound creates emotional affect. When you try and create novel sounds, what you're doing is you're trying to create a framework for novel shades of musical feeling. Mark Masters wrote a review of the well-tuned piano for Pitchfork Magazine. In case you're wondering, it got a 9.5. In it, he wrote that Lamont Young discovered profundity in concrete things, mathematical equations, thought out structures, individual sounds as direct catalysts for individual feelings. Searching for musical ideas in unorthodox places, like for example, the harmonic series of an infrasonic resonance can be enormously inspiring. And so even if there isn't that catalyst for individual feeling, uh, just getting excited about the wonderful weird world of sound can be enough to spark the creative flame. And so, even though I'm fairly disappointed that this inquiry into infrasound and the frequency of ocular resonance didn't give me the ability to see ghosts, at least I got a cool little funky microtonal tune out of it all. <laughs> 